to see you. Good to see you as well. Where are you today? In Berlin still. Okay. And how is everything going in Berlin? Yeah, great. Uh, we're just about to travel on a plane for the first time since COVID, actually, in a couple of weeks. Just have a well-earned break. Mm -hmm. This year has been a little bit uh, full on, really positive, you know, for the business, but also we've realised we need to slow down a little bit. <laughs> okay, so where will you travel? Uh, just to see uh, my partner's family, so to Serbia, mm -hmm. just for 10 days, because we have quite a few projects that we're not sure about when the start date is, so we really can't go too far right now. Yeah. I think 10 days, we just have to be grateful for any break we can get at the That's moment. So. word, isn't it? Gratitude. <laughs> the simple pictures, <laughs> like just simply yeah. to see our family. It's We can't take it for granted anymore. No, no. I haven't seen my mum since about 19 months, actually. So the priority was for, for Vera and my wife to go back simply because she has to have dental treatments around the same time. <laughs> so we just thought, right, let's let's see, you know, some of the kids, brother, et cetera. And then hopefully if, if the UK stays as is, I'm going to try and get back in October, but let's see. I just hope the numbers don't increase. I suppose that, um, yeah. the pandemic has exposed the, like how disparate families can be these days. Like in the olden days, it's like your immediate family would be living right next door or in the same yeah. And now it's not even in the next country. It's like, you know, maybe even in a different continent. And, um, and so our stories seems, our family stories seem to be a lot more fragmented relative. Mm. Have you noticed that as well over the last couple of years, well, months? Uh, well, I, I guess for me, because I've been an expat for most of my adult life, it's always been that way. And, I, and I've been deeply curious. And that's why I love the topic of <laughs> what you were going to explore this year, because, yeah, I just got good at really being comfortable around my own stories, but also being open to the fact that I quite often tell myself stories that are just not true. Mm -hmm. And yeah, our families, because there's been that separation, I know there's technology, you know, great that we've got Zoom, etc., but yeah, I'm not sure that, I, I think the longer I stayed away from my immediate family, you know, things like I'm not part of the narrative, but not in a bad way. It's just that I'm not in their thoughts every day, like most of my other family members that live maybe in a 50 mile radius, you know, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that it's up to me to make sure I check in with my mom and my brother and the nieces, I make sure that I'm part of that narrative, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so maybe like you're not central stage in that story anymore because you. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's it's good for the ego to test that, you know, it's not all about me. The world doesn't revolve around Peter. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's quite humbling, you know, but yeah, it, it, it also upset me. I'll never forget. I think the first time I'd lived abroad. And I came back after a year thinking that everyone would be super interested. And after five minutes, it was it's almost like I didn't leave. And then I, and I got curious, you know, about why is that psychologically? And now I know. But uh, initially, when I first experienced it, it was a little bit unnerving. And I felt a little bit upset that people were not really that you know, curious about what's been my experience in the last year. They, they went straight into, um, you know, the problems and challenges locally. But that's what we do. And I'm guilty of it too, so. <laughs> yeah, that, that's very interesting because I used to travel a lot and yeah. um, I went to Machu Picchu and I, yeah. you know, like really interesting things like that. And I, like yourself, it was like when I came back, no one wanted to see the food pit. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have our own stories we create our own stories and our friends who share the same values will be interested in those stories yeah. our families unless they've traveled with us why would they want to be part of that story that they were not you know they, they didn't have a position in those stories mm -hmm. they were on the margins of it so there is this interrelationship between our identity and our values and also our behaviors it's like um, our identities, like who we are as part of our family and our, our identities in the families that we create, you know, like you have your partner and you've co-created a story with your partner and your friends, uh, you know, in, in your immediate circle. That's another story that your birth family are not part of that story, right? Yeah. 
I, yeah, I, I find this whole topic fascinating because I don't know if you thought about this, but I, I'm really, really geeky. You know, I love to research and I'm not a researcher. You know that I'm, I don't have the that academic background that you do, Jasper, but I'm deeply curious about these kind of topics because the work that I do with our clients, you know, and with the mind takeaway, being a coach and a consultant, it's really fascinating how stories can be so impactful, you know, for people, but they're also very powerful and you have to be careful because sometimes you can incite change with a story and change someone's narrative for the worst. I'll give you an example. My, my wife grew up as a refugee in a war zone and two sides that were part of the same country, which was former Yugoslavia, they were fed a narrative, both sides of the fence, you know, from the news that each side was going to come to kill you. And sadly, that caused division and fear. And instantly, people were called to arms and anyone that could fight, you know, were, were taken, you know, active. And actually, fa families were divided, you know, and people that were, you know, weeks before were calling each other friend because of division and because of that narrative that was fed to a whole population. So it's so powerful how both for positive and negative stories like or not the part of our, you know, that ingrained in our existence were prime for them, I believe. And if you think about, you know, I read a book recently, I can't remember which one, uh, but it, it just reminded me that we evolved to tell stories. We're unique as far as we know on this planet, at least that, you know, bees, for example, can do a bee dance and, and pass information onto the hive, but they're not really telling stories in that fact, you know, we're the only ones that develop language and I'm guessing that, you know, millions of years ago around the campfire, people were starting to develop language and then share information that was useful and probably frivolous, you know, what gossip the village was getting up to and the like. So we've always, I guess, had stories and a narrative. And even psychologically, I don't know if you thought about this, but we create our own experience, right, moment to moment. So it always blows my mind when I get reminded of that, that, we are always telling ourselves stories by looking at the information around us, you know? So it's, yeah, deeply fascinating, right? It is fascinating. And when you talk about the bees not having language, it's, um, well, maybe their behavior is their language, you know? Yeah, they, yeah. they pass on um, that innate wisdom of like what is safe and what is dangerous through their behavior. We, our behavior includes you know, the verbal language, but animals, they, they have sounds, they, mm. they, bees have sound, you know, they, they probably sing their songs. And a lot of cultures, a lot of human cultures, they pass on their stories through songs, through, mm. dance. you know, a dance can be like, that's a great way of telling a story as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, yeah, it's so true. Cultural heritage. I mean, I'm a musician for anyone that doesn't know and that actually I learned quite early on that again amazing that you know music or anything creative can be a currency can be a language so when I create music I'm creating a narrative for myself and you know I'm getting excited and curious about making that piece of music and then I'm always thinking about you know how would that transfer what would the audience think about it but I've got nothing on it right and actually the more powerful uh in terms of the piece of music for me I know it's subjective but I was just like well it excited me and here's my narrative to it I'm just curious to what the outside world might think about it by listening to that piece of music but I know it's subjective right some people can listen to a very dark piece of music but actually feel quite happy and wholesome and the next person could say wow that's not for me you know <laughs> yeah. I mean there was a time when I hated classical music <laughs> you know, I just absolutely hated it. And, yeah. and, you know, that's when I was a teenager and, you know, maybe like it's an acquired taste that comes as we mature mm. um, and heavy metal. I've never understood how people can enjoy heavy metal. For example, for me, it's like it's very aggressive. Mm. And, um, and and as you say, some people may listen to that a little bit like how people watch horror films and feel great after they've watched a horror film maybe it's unleashed some sort of anxiety that they've had and and it's a cathartic reaction that they feel um it's you know there, there's a sense of well-being that it wasn't reality you know maybe heavy metal has that kind of impact as well yeah yeah 
It's interesting you talk about stories that can be used to create fear and division between people like in Serbia, Yugoslavia, in Punjab, you know, stories mm. were created like during partition between like when Punjab was divided. Yeah, yeah. So that's, those are, those are uh, stories that occur in so many, in, in Ireland, Northern Ireland, Protestant, Catholic, you know, in, in, in Africa, you know, the, in Nigeria, like different tribes. So he, the, as human beings, I think we are um, experts at creating stories that will kind of elevate our own position at the expense of the other sometimes. And that can be very disrupt, dis, destructive, can't it? Mm. Yeah, and it's just, for me, I'm in the game of helping people with, you know, their awareness, right? It's just being aware of the stories you tell yourself can be both impactful and damaging, but also the stories that you share with the outside world. As you said before, with your family, with your friends, with, with the outside world in terms of, you know, the public. So, yeah, I mean, we can't always be super mindful and be worried about, you know, otherwise you would never talk, right? There'd be no language coming out of your mouth. But I'm, I'm just careful when I, when I notice it about the impact I have when I share a story or for example, if I'm trying to help someone, I'm always trying to share it from my lived experience. Not that it's not impactful sharing someone else's story, but again, what makes us uniquely human is we can connect with another human being if we can hear you know, that the adversity or yeah, me too. I also used to struggle with something, you know, and, and then people can connect with you at a deeper level versus, sharing someone else's story and actually it's more authentic and it it's you can't fake authenticity and vulnerability right so if i share a story of my own personal adversity to try and help someone it usually has more impact than me picking it off the shelf or sharing an anecdote of research although that's also quite useful and you know can also help as well yeah. and sometimes um like a story we either feel that we belong in that story and then sometimes there comes a point where we think well i no longer want to be a part of this story and if people choose you know they most refugees wouldn't choose to be refugees mm. sometimes that they feel like that's the only choice that is available to them because they cannot remain part of that story that is um predominant in their in their country and so they have to escape and that becomes a story in itself, doesn't it? Or yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Or the story of somebody's in a in a relationship that is dysfunctional, and they think I no longer can be, you know, it's no no longer sustainable for me to be a part of this story, and then that creates divorce. But even the divorce creates a story. Yeah, and I've actually been through a divorce, and I don't mind sharing that fact. And it was actually. Deeply challenging, I'm not going to lie, but it was also a massive area of growth and change for me. And, and I'm grateful for the learning years after, although when you go through these, uh, you know, uh, bouts of adversity or this human experience, sometimes going through it is deeply uncomfortable and challenging. But if you're willing to learn some lessons, again, I just become more aware of how that relationship ended. And again, yeah, as you said, the narrative that I was telling myself. And yeah, it, it, when you catch yourself, you know, the, the best question I always ask myself and, and always, you know, when I'm helping others is, is that really true? And I'm looking at it from a lens of curiosity, you know, not from being judgmental, because what I want to know is, you know, is that really true? You know, in a light sense, that story I've been telling myself for the last decade, is that really something that's tangible? And is it also helping me or is it actually holding me back? And then when you're willing to explore that, the narrative can actually change quite often for the better. And then you end up telling yourself another story, you know? <laughs> and that question, is that really true? Is there is, um, is it Katie? Um, there, there's, there's a person who has four questions. And the first question is, is that really true? You know, are you sure it's true? And, and she has a set of four questions. Katie Byron, I can't remember her name. Sure, there is there is someone who does the work around that. And and I think, you know, maybe like it's true from their point of view. You know, it's like, is it like, can we see that? Like in every story, there's our there, there's our version of events, like mm. you know, the perspective that we can see from the position that we're taking, but can we 
look at it from another angle, you know, because so the, the concept is like, well, yes, it is true from the, you know, from where I'm looking at it. But if I shift my position, if I look at it from a different angle, mm -hmm. it will look differently. And maybe that's the power of like stories. It's like when we're able to see ourselves in the story that we can change our role in the story. You know, I know you're familiar with NLP. They call that, you know, multiple perspectives. It's like taking on different perspectives. Mm. Isn't it? And that's that's one of the ways that we can be more reflective on what we're doing is by shifting our, our positions and looking at the reality from a different mm. angle. Not that the way we were looking at it, not that that was not true. It's just that that was only one perspective. Let's look at it from a multiple perspective. Yeah. Well, I don't think I've thought about this. I mean, modern psychology and neuroscience has already proven that we're, we live in a world of controlled hallucinations. And what I'm really saying there is when I enter a room, my brain works out a prediction of what everything should look like. So what I find really fascinating, but also quite scary when I first heard it, is that we actually are all creating our own version of reality moment to moment so as you say it can be really impactful and actually the only way you can calibrate each other and work out what's reality a shared reality is by being curious listening to another people and and actually showing up and listening to their story and meeting in the middle and, and I find it really quite interesting that we can all create a version of a room and we can all agree that we can see you know the, the light and the furniture and whatever else is in the room but it's actually our version of it and I don't know if you thought about this but <laughs> my wife was explaining to me this morning she told me a story that I'd forgotten about and she said isn't it amazing that when we look out in the world there's so much information that we're bombarded with say even just simply walking down the street in the neighborhood and she forgot to notice uh, an English bookshop because we live in Germany and Berlin and I just knew that bookshop existed because I'd actually live in, lived in the neighborhood before my wife moved into the neighborhood and we never talked about it. And years later, one day I entered the bookshop and my wife was shocked. She said, I didn't realize there was a new bookshop. And I said, I'd been there for five years. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing that it's got nothing to do with intellect or anything else. It's just that we create a version of reality and sometimes we miss stuff that's so obvious. And when I started to be curious about that over the years, I catch myself doing it. But it's also, you know, it can be a bit scary and annoying, but I'm also grateful that I'm just willing to accept that I'm going to make mistakes. And as we talked about, I'm more willing just to be showing up and listening to other people and asking more questions and being curious. And that usually puts you in good stead for learning about new information. And it can also catch you with your own biases and blind spots. Because uh, as we've explored, right, my story, although I might think it's true, until I talk to you, Jezva, I just don't know if that's actually reality or not. <laughs> well, it's your reality. Yeah. It's your yeah. reality. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, you know, from your point of view, and I think as researchers, especially as a qualitative researcher, we have to be um, very mindful of what we're including and what we're not including. You know, so there's there's always that proviso when we explain any of our conclusions. It's like, well, we're only looking at this from this angle, not from those angles, you know, like we're only looking at it from this point of view. And those are all the other points of views that we have. Mm -hmm. For example, I know that you're interested in creativity. And so we're having this conversation about creativity and stories and, and we both share similar values. And somebody who is not interested in creativity, somebody who doesn't share our values, they will see, you know, they will, um, they will pick up on things that we haven't even noticed in this conversation, either good or bad. But because we um, are on the same kind of um, playing field, I suppose, there are things that we notice that they will miss and vice mm. versa. You know, and, and that's the thing with these conferences. It's like um, people who are interested in creativity take part. But what about all those who are not interested in creativity who don't take part? What about their points of view? Well, they will remain unknown to me because they don't engage in a conversation with me.
Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, that there's so much information that's left on the table that's unknown to us. And I guess, again, I mean, I'm deeply curious, and I know you are, Jesper, otherwise you wouldn't have even started this wonderful conference, right? But yeah, it's just the more I look to other perspectives from people who are different than me, the more value I find. And yeah, it's not the easiest thing, even for me, if I'm honest, even though I'm comfortable looking at other perspectives and views. And I don't know if you've thought about this, but where my narrative changed for the better is when I didn't value my own opinion so much. So I obviously had values and beliefs and I stand by them, of course. But when I say I don't value my opinion, as you said before, I just know that everything's my best guess. You know, I'm reading research. There's always something that might be missing. And I'm more curious just to know, OK, well, this is my best guess. I've read this stuff. And, you know, wh what do you think? And quite often I'm gifted with new information, sometimes not, but quite often I'm like, wow, had I not asked, you know, and showed curiosity and respect and wanted to listen to that other person, I would never have been gifted with a new perspective on life. And, and again, quite often that narrative changes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I remember in my very first conversation with you, um, in the very first conversation, I know like there was a difference in of opinion in terms of whether creativity needs to be valuable, you know, whether yeah. value is, is integral to creativity. And, and I came from research that said, well, yes, you know, otherwise it's not creativity. And going back to the point of like, well, remember that there are people who don't value creativity. And one of the reasons they don't value creativity is because they don't think it's valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and so we, because we're interested in creativity, we can kind of like start to make assumptions about, well, everyone must be interested in creativity because, you know, look how life enhancing it is. Well, not for everyone, because some yeah. people, they think that creativity is a waste of time, it's disruptive, it's, uh, you know, it wastes resources that can be used on much better things like efficiency, for example, or, mm. you know, so, um, so I suppose when we create a story around creativity, we have to include those who don't fit in with the narrative that we have co-created about mm. it. Now, that's a really valuable point because, over the years, if I want to help more people and have impact in the world, exactly that, I've realized that you've got to meet people where they are. And yeah, you're totally right, Jesper, and I used to get it wrong just like everyone else. I'd be trying to sell creativity, and and it, and it wasn't, you know, I'm, it's not that I'm not comfortable with sales, but it, it's trying to force it on someone, right? And again, if, if I'm willing to look at their perspective, and if they don't value it, then I find something useful in the narrative that might pique their interest. Yeah, so that's a really good point. And sometimes it's to do with the language that we use, because every story, like, you know, if you tell me a story in German, I won't mm. understand it because I don't. Either would I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sadly. Yeah. So we have to use the right language. And so, you know, somebody could say, well, you know something, I think creativity is a waste of time. But then I might say to you, well, do you think learning is a waste of time? And they'll say, no, learning mm. is useful. Well, you know, maybe when I'm talking about creativity, I'm actually talking about learning. I'm talking about growth. I'm talking about finding out things that we don't know, you know, like going into that unknown mis mystery of reality that we don't mm. know. Is that valuable? And then they say, well, yes, that's valuable, but that's not creativity. That's learning. And yeah. we're just using two different words for a concept which is um can be spoken about using different languages you know you can speak about creativity in mandarin you can talk about creativity using sign language you know whatever but the thing is that stories the ling linguistics that we used for storytelling they have to be appropriate to the context don't they yeah, because otherwise, it, you know, you're just going to lose interest or you're not going to have traction, right? Yeah, and it, it's a good reminder. I mean, when, when I often speak to people who don't, again, I try not to make an assumption, but my best guess is they don't really have that awareness that creativity is all around them. I usually start by saying, do you realize you create everything moment to moment in, in the form of thought? So therefore, 
we cannot not be deeply creative. So separate the art from it. What do you think about that? And that usually sets us on a path of curiosity together to explore it. And I don't know about you, Jezbo, but I'm quite comfortable with people pushing back because that's where the learning is. I, I often push back if I don't believe or, you know, I'm not comfortable with something or it's not something that I've been aware of myself or it's not a narrative I'm comfortable with. I'm going to ask questions or I'm going to be curious. And, and it's, all, it's actually quite enlightening when someone holds that space and, and, is, and is patient with you and says, OK, you might not believe this, but have you thought about it in this way? So, yeah, the value of storytelling in that respect is really deeply amazing. It can be transformational as well, especially in the world of education, right? Yeah, that's right. You you mentioned the word enlightening and it reminded me of the period of what is called the Enlightenment. Yeah. The Enlightenment didn't occur with people sitting in cafes agreeing with each other. <laughs> the Enlightenment <laughs> occurred with people, yeah. you know, having debates and discussions and being mm. very, you know, the, creating like so much conflict verbally that it it kind of that conflict is necessary to sharpen the skills you know to sharpen the diamond I suppose isn't it and to to enable something to emerge that didn't exist before and that wouldn't have existed unless they had sat down and debated a debate where people where both sides agree with each, with each other is no longer a debate is it no it's a feedback loop and again I can say I'm honestly innocent. You know, we're all guilty of it. But again, it's it's that understanding the stories that we tell ourselves and realizing that sometimes we need to get outside information and check in with other humans to make sure that that narrative can be, I guess, you know, it just needs to evolve, right? Because all stories, I was pondering this when you, when uh, you asked me to, you know, to have a chat. So thank you, because I love these conversations. And I just thought, I don't know if you thought about this, but all, all stories, they require change, right? It's a narrative just by default. And then you throw that in the mix with, when you say about, you know, having dissent and talking to another person that doesn't agree with you. That's when it's absolutely amazing, the power of stories, because if you're willing to listen to each other's narrative, then new stories are created and that's how society evolves. Someone told me the other day, I don't know if I was reading it, that literature in terms of novels, I don't know if it was the 1700s, that when novels were written by famous authors around the narrative of people that were from lower classes, it wasn't until then that, for example, certain movements and people become aware of each other's struggles. So therefore they become more compassionate towards each other in terms of humanity. And that's apparently, again, I don't know if they can prove it, but it spawned movements. And that's how things change, right? And I guess that's how revolutions happen, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that the great shift is when we start to tell our own stories rather than our stories being told by others. And this is one of the reasons that I created these conferences is because, you know, I, I want to I want to hear everyone's stories like their own lived experiences rather than sitting passively listening to mm -hmm. a couple of elevated people who call themselves keynote speakers and and <laughs> the majority of people listen to to their stories it's like no I think our own stories are interesting enough don't you honestly I think everyone's story has its place and yeah I mean <laughs> I would much rather listen to someone's wonderful, rich story and their history than some, again, there's nothing wrong with keynote speeches. I have to do them sometimes, but again, they're kind of, you know, polished and they have to be nice and shiny. Whereas someone's story, like we talked about, is deeply vulnerable and authentic and you can't fake that. And, and it's that, it's that vulnerability and authenticity that dra draws you in as a human being. And it actually creates a deeper connection and it's more, you know, it, it, it's our shared consciousness, is it not, you know? Yes. And I mean, I've been to conferences where I've spent six months <laughs> refining my speech. <laughs> and um, and I, uh, so there came a point, I think that was in 2016, that was the last mm. conference that I, I did. And I thought, you know, something, I much prefer a conversation because it's creative and it's, um, I'm not, I'm, th I'm thinking, it forces you to think in a much deeper sense, doesn't it? Because 
you're in touch with your known. I have no idea what you're going to say. And therefore, I'm listening more attentively compared mm. with if I'm if I've practiced my speech and I've rehearsed it and I I deliver the speech. Most people at conferences that I've attended, you know, and I'm sure you've yeah. experienced this too. Most people they leave after they've de they've delivered their own speech, which I've which always... is such a shame, right? I, I guess maybe they've just that release of all that nervousness of planning. Maybe it's just innocent in a way. But yeah, we're just missing that massive gift of listening to other people's perspective and I love what you said about lived experiences because yeah I'd rather share mostly from my lived experience if I'm trying to help or, or especially if I'm writing a speech or I'm doing a presentation because it, it's more deeply impactful it, it's more organic right not that there shouldn't be data and fact and all of that that has its place but what I find is if it's a, a shared experience from my own life I find that it draws people in because everyone loves a protagonist. They, they like to hear the struggles and the changes that all, all humans go through. And when it comes from another human that's deeply authentic and it's your truth, that has more traction, or at least that's my best guess from when, when I share, for example, like I said before, someone else's story and I make my presentation more facts heavy. It doesn't always have the same impact. But again, I'm just learning. So I, I just find that I always try and add at least two stories from my own life or my own family or my friends or the people around me. And that usually has more impact than when I'm trying to deliver a narrative or, you know, insight change, or maybe even just get someone to be curious for the first time. Yeah. And I suppose that um, there are archetypes and not everyone identifies with being a hero. Yeah. You might, <laughs> you might um, as a keynote speaker, you may adopt the archetype of being the hero who survived all these different challenges, but that might not touch everyone's experience. Mm. And, and in a coaching situation, you may adopt the archetype of like the next door neighbor, for example, you know, the every man. I think Carl Jung called it that archetype. He labeled it every man. And I think of it as like the next door neighbor, um, that's someone who's at your own level. And I think this is what I try to do with these conferences is that we are like next door neighbors. We're having conversations rather than one person being on a, on a platform elevated mm -hmm. and out of reach. Yeah, I totally agree because to connect with other humans, they have to see a mirror of themselves, right? And that's why all of the best novels and the best stories that have traction that are still told to this day, are, you know, they weave exactly what you've just said. You know, they 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 allow the population or large amounts of people to identify in that narrative and say, actually, me too. That's that, you know, and it draws you in as opposed to, as you said, something where you can't really relate to it because you don't have that in your lived experience today. Yeah. So um, finally, then the thing about mystery around creativity, what from your perspective, what is still mysterious about creativity that we we should be exploring? In terms of stories, I just find it deeply fascinating that no matter where people are in the world, this is developed in the same way. Although the narrative and you know our culture shapes massively the way we see things in the world. You know, I could look at an image and I could look at an image with someone from Japan. And because of our bringing on a cultural heritage, even though we see the same image, we'll, we'll, we'll be drawn to certain objects in that image based on our culture. You know, the Western culture is different than Eastern culture. And I still never get bored of that. And it mystifies me that, you know, how do we all have this shared experience of living in stories? And, and why is it to date only a deeply human experience. I mean, I know we've shared that, you know, you could argue that animals do have some kind of limited currency in storytelling and definitely language for sure, but it's just that they don't seem to be able to carry it as far as we have, or at least maybe we haven't unearthed it yet through our research and our curiosity. So yeah, it keeps me drawn in. And when I seen the topic, Jesper, I was like, wow, yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite topics to, to get curious about storytelling. Yeah. yeah, I suppose, again, like the work of Carl Jung, the collective unconscious, I think he he drew together his theories from Eastern, Western, you know, like um, a whole array of cultures and and the archetypes that he's 
he talks about the 12 different archetypes. They're based on stories told around the world, which in terms of archetypes, they're very similar. You know, everyone has, every culture seems to have the hero and the villain. You know, the, the, those two characters are, you know, I suppose the hero is like our survival instinct and the villain is like the dangers that we face. And, you know, so we have to navigate our stories are about how are we navigating successfully to overcome all the dangers that will will um, come across our our experience. Yeah, when you look at it like that, it is a universal currency that we 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 can share in that language, regardless of what language we speak or what our cultural heritage or background is, and that's what I find really fascinating. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. And love, I suppose, every culture has that story about love, you know, because love being the motivating force, it's like whatever we're motivated to do, like what, whatever we're passionate about doing, it has to, there is that force of love. And, and sometimes I think creativity and love can be synonymous because mm. um, it, they're both um, very powerful for, you know, maybe it's, it's exactly the same force you express that force through your music yeah. someone else can express it through their art and someone else can express it through conversations you know but it's that it has to charisma come arises from that love and the power that goes together with that love right yeah i love that you said that because the more i explore creativity as an artist as well the more i realized that the more i loved myself and not from an egocentric point of view, you know, get up saying, I love you and all of that. It's just been aware that when I felt safe and curious and I wasn't trying to be cognitive and overthink things, I just slipped into that state of pure creativity. And, and yeah, how I, I would agree. I, I don't know if you could separate them. Th those wonderful feelings you get from a deep sense of love for yourself, for your family, for the world around you, for nature. I, I feel the same when I actually create, whether it's you know telling a story or making a piece of music, I actually feel that it's that same wonderful power, innate power that we all have access to that sometimes we forget. And quite often, like we talked about, that some people replace that with fear. And sadly, that's what leads to some of the conflict in the world. Yeah, and so it's it's very often a feeling, and I've heard so many people say like that book was just kind of like, or the poem, it, it was just kind of like knocking at your door. It wasn't even a feeling, it was like, um, it was bursting to come out. It was, so it was this kind of overwhelming kind of energy, rather than a feeling, it was just simply energy that was bursting to express itself. And, um, and, so that creativity, sometimes it's not even a conscious choice. It's, it's as though we feel compelled to express something either in mm. words or, you know, other forms of art. So, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I don't really feel I have any control over it. I feel that I can be productive. So I, again, because I'm more comfortable about not overthinking. So it's more likely that creativity the lightning will strike me, you know, I'm, I'm like a conduit for it. But yeah, I'm just grateful when it happens because actually the less control I have over it and I just let it take shape and, and form. And I actually, I'm always never surprised, but it, it's it's only my ego that wants to lay claim that says, look what I've done. I am, I am amazing as a musician or whatever it is, but I'm actually humbled by just whatever it happens, you know. And, and I think the more that you can do that and be curious as a human, the more impact you can have in the world. And you'd be surprised at what you can allow to emerge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, great. Allowing to emerge, that's where the mystery is. It's like, what is yeah. it? Is, um, the mystery is like, with, like, without being in conscious control, what is it that we are allowing to emerge through us? Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Pete. That's I've loved my conversation with you. And You're welcome. I always enjoy these conversations. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, I'll speak with you soon. Bye.